allow me to rethink progress in an age where progress might be turning into a nightmare on an apocalyptic scale. But first, let me make an introductory observation about this nightmare and its lesser known counterfactual nature. Maybe the way we perceive our future needs to be revisited with thoughts that deviate so much from how we currently plan and order our world that it might seem like sci-fi futurism when it is simply drastic measures for drastic times. Let us start with sci-fi stories just to set the scene. It is interesting that so many sci-fi stories talk about a future where the entire human race is divided into a dualist sphere of the rich and the poor, powerful and weak, the haves and the have-nots. I think of stories that are told in movies like Elysium, with Matt Damon's character, who is the hero, and Jodie Foster's character, who represent the elitist anti-hero. But why should this be the case? Maybe popular fiction is stuck in 19th century ideological thinking, and our minds are stuck on this dualist utopia versus apocalypse theme. However, our shared experience since the fall of communism at the end of the 20th century and the ideological declaration of victory by the liberal democratic ideology today shows us that maybe all universal utopian ideological claims are losing the battle against good old multifaceted non-utopian common sense human nature. A crucible where global interconnectedness creates a hollowing and emptying effect into which pure human nature is flowing. If this unease with how we see our modern or future selves are depicted the way our stories propose, then why do we perpetuate this dualist fading empire of the mind in our stories? Do we really believe it to be our future or are we simply expected to believe that future? Why do these sci-fi stories have such shallow heroes only able to save maybe one single and very personal love relationship, almost like a mirror of a single organism only saving itself in the closest thing it loves? Why do these weak heroes only disrupt the power status quo on the surface, expecting the evil empire to endure in the end? Why do we not see the real ecosystem of abundant species of human communities? A multitude of loosely networked, politically modern and technologically advanced communities consisting of their own set of powerful and weak people, rich and poor members in one and the same dedicated community, who nevertheless inherently care for each other. Why do we not see the body politic of families and communities that build their own valuable life experiences? A relationship ecosystem where all kinds of elites and many kinds of specialists and vibrant energetic technicians, artists, act together as smaller collections of various species of natural unities. Communities where familial, ethnic, religious, cultural, aesthetic and economic commitments of any individual or group find expression within the network of human interaction. Interactions that are simply good or bad, but most importantly, interactions that are still able to be healed and sanctified, turning bad into good, or simply improving towards the highest possible human experience. I see this new redeeming state of nature as a much better state of progress than the dualistic state still being promoted as part of a forced identity of controlling or being controlled. Maybe our programmed idea of progress is still part of a deliberate vision of purely mechanistic, amoral, power relationships that has little place for the real conscious life, life's healing potential and the abundance of life forms we do experience regardless of our own socio-economic status. Maybe it is part of the counterfactual ideological fixation on the mechanistic superiority of survival specialists like viruses and bacteria that we might even want to mimic in our own mechanistic survival behaviors. While, on the other hand, we seem to be ignoring the amazing ability of consciousness and conscious cooperation of frail 
less adapted for survival, complex organisms like us. Even so, we have antibodies and life-preserving systems and mutually supporting ecosystems. And we see it everywhere within our entire biosphere, with or without human technologies to help or hamper. A reality that is consciously cooperating, ever healing, always sanctifying all life with all its mistakes and evils. Always towards love for each other and towards our love, or at least towards our search for God. With this observation in mind, we have a new and useful scene that might be able to contain a new idea with which I would like to rethink progress in a very pragmatic and engineered way. It is important to realize that this is a very concentrated vision of a hybrid non-utopian idea that might have real life potential. For now, until I have enough insight and feedback to write this article into a book form, you most certainly will have to dilute these concentrated ideas with your own insights about common sense, practical, engineering and social methods at your disposal. Let me begin with a guiding principle I borrowed from Machiavelli, but to be open about my misgivings. Even though I think Machiavelli from the 14th century was extremely influential in most of the Renaissance and Enlightenment, thinking that created much of today's scene of progress. I am trying to rethink. I am more convinced today than at any time before that Machiavelli was mostly an evil worshipper of death for power's sake, like most of his modern disciples, fixating on finding ways to use the power of evils just because it is part of our reality, like pathogens always present in all life forms, both moral and physical pathogens. Machiavelli and many modern thinkers actively promote deceit, backhandedness, feigned love, corruption, etc. While they underplay the need to acknowledge and act according to the continuous and active systems and natural behaviors that are identifying, suppressing and removing evils, just like antibodies, without us even knowing, always working to overcome moral pathogens, healing and nurturing as the core reality of life and abundance that is the ultimate objective of all conscious cooperation, I simply cannot see the processes of death as the Machiavellian and even Darwinian power of progress it has been made out to be, mostly since the 19th century. Machiavelli influenced the Western mind to fixate on fear and death as a controlling force, an underplayed life because everywhere I see independent conscious decision makers convincing themselves of this counterfactual reality. However, to get over my own biases and be fair to the subject that I want to rethink, let me use the bona fide aspect of Machiavelli's overall claim that he take the world as it is, as a guiding principle for this idea. In fact, to take the world as it is, is the fundamental rule of thumb used by many political scientists, and I will take their lead on this. For that reason, you will find that this idea actively tries to take the world as it is, with all its messiness, illness, and predators, together with all life-sustaining systems and efforts. I take the world as it is, and propose something that might fit right into our own messy world. I propose something humans can do right now because they are already doing similar things today, for good or for ill. The core idea, completely isolate all the supply of heat and electrical energy from all other human activities. Yes, as simple as that. The idea is to change the way we think about and achieve energy supply, but in this case specifically, only heat and electrical energy in its purest form. The most natural analogy of this radical idea is to isolate our energy supply. Almost like the sun is isolated at the center of our solar system while it supplies, without interruption, energy to our biosphere. But in this case, we isolate our own energy supply from the ecosystem of normal human economic activities. Apart from that, we eventually try to isolate our own human energy needs from the needs of the biosphere at large to the greatest extent possible, leaving the energy from the sun to sustain our biosphere while we use our own independent 
economically isolated and newly created energy supply to take care of all our own activities, our hopes and dreams, and our previous, current, and future reckless impact we almost certainly had and will have on our precious biosphere. How then to rethink progress? As a first attempt to implement this core idea and rethink progress, I propose that we create a globally networked community of trusted enterprises with the sole purpose of supplying abundant, new generation, clean and baseload heat and electrical energy through economically isolated and trusted supply methods. The concept of proto-commodity refers to the extremely unique nature of this energy supply because it implies that by virtue of its mutually agreed nature, it is not a commodity yet. Therefore, it cannot be valued or paid for like a commodity and will therefore be supplied without cost to any human enterprise that needs energy, without exception. This proto-commodity concept seems to be a logical requirement if we want to successfully isolate the energy supply for human consumption from all other economic activities. This independent supply of heat and electrical energy will have to happen through a network of trusted enterprises with complete ownership, protection and operation. That is, most importantly, completely isolated from the rest of the world's economic and political activities. Preferably with a very small physical footprint that can be operated and maintained out of sight of most other human activities. This isolated and internally networked community's sole purpose will be to supply heat and electrical energy to communities as a trusted proto-commodity enabler of all existing and new human activities. Reality and taking the world as it is, dictates that the implementation of this isolated energy supply network must be phased in as its potential and viability become known to us through a dedicated research and exploration effort. This idea of an independent and isolated supply of energy is critically dependent on the principle of no unwarranted moral or political strings attached. It must be, as far as possible, as a fundamental requirement completely independent with completely fungible energy supply characteristics. As justification, this isolated energy supply activity will in principle overcome most of the current deadlocks experienced in human thinking as it attempts to find a capital investment and monetary linked solution to the immense but disputed scale of energy needs for basic human survival and progress. The aim is to decouple energy supply from any ideology or social construct or political objectives while in its own sphere, still maintaining all other normal, actively pursued ideologies and social constructs that humans inherently act out and develop over time. It is human nature as it is standing apart from the supply of heat and electrical energy. The allocation of all the raw materials, know-how, technology and work needed for this independent energy supply community of trust or IES COT must be negotiated, freely allocated from nature's stores, planned, implemented, executed and protected within the same kind of independent global commitments that is found in the moral trust and aspirations intended for something like the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or our existing global monetary system. Except that this IES COT will deliberately act with only one single imperative to the exclusion of all others and that is to ensure that any human activity will have trusted access to all the necessary heat and electrical energy required to be in principle successful in all its stated or implied objectives. The proposed independence and isolation of energy supply through an ISCOT do not imply covert, obscure or hidden processes. On the contrary, it expects complete society-wide communication and openness of the activities of this ISCOT to all interest groups regardless of their status and relationship with each other. However, only complete openness to viewing their activities, comment on it and request energy while planning your own economic activities, but completely isolated from any direct control 
of the IS Scots activities. A break of independent and trusted supply is the only plane of accountability and direct oversight. This is the seemingly obvious way to ensure its independent status and trust. While all other human interests and relationships can maintain their inherent characteristics of trust, harmony, distrust and conflicts, law and order, interpretations of universal human rights, etc. The IES COT will therefore operate on the purest set of physical principles available to achieve its single mandate, taking human nature into account only to the extent that the IES COT's actions and intentions must continuously be measured and realigned to all aspects of its single objective. The same healing nature found in all complex human societies. The measure of success for the idea is that the IS COT must prove its progressive success with both the physical increase in the percentage of the total expected global quantity and reach of supply to communities and their enterprises that is also calculated as a function of the increasing percentage of energy supplied according to the physical theoretical limit of the current optimal baseload energy source being exploited. Ever increasing and ever improving energy supply as its only measure of success. During the execution of the IES COTS mandate to achieve success with its singular objective, potential oversupply of energy should not be considered a disadvantage because the entire IES COT is isolated from the rest of the economy. It is a fair expectation that the IES COT is able to, transparently but independently, plan and control the oversupply capacity and able to have generation units in storage, able to quickly deploy, switch on and off the generation units as required by the economic signals received and transparently interpreted from any of the networked economic actors being supplied by the ISCOT. The community at large will always be responsible to generate accurate economic signals for its own purposes as well as for the ISCOT to use in its supply decisions. Why nuclear baseload makes the best artificial sun? With these measures and capacity of supply in mind, it logically follows that nuclear fission is currently the optimal baseload source with future potential for nuclear fusion energy. This is the case because the kinds and amounts of resources necessary to generate nuclear fission energy are the smallest physical volume of resources known to humanity. It will have by far the smallest impact on our current global store of resources. This small resource footprint is considered to be a critical prerequisite to enable independence and an unobtrusive, contained and manageable infrastructure to be produced, deployed, operated, maintained and recycled. Full life cycle ownership by the ESCOT. Isolating nuclear energy enterprises in an ESCOT contains the structure of a potential solution to the control and safety challenges associated with the large-scale adoption of nuclear energy in our age. Instead of expecting all aspects of our human nature to achieve the necessary moral and ethical fidelity that is reasonably capable of protecting our biosphere from the dangers of nuclear power, you isolate the nuclear energy activities into a community of trust that is completely independent but also completely open for review by all because it is deliberately isolated from all other human interests. This article does not have the space to introduce the nuclear energy industry, the technology landscape and current advancements. I will only trust that the logical realities of humanity's ability to turn mass into energy will be considered part of our moral duty to implement safely and successfully. The success of the AISCOT will be noticed when fossil fuels, as our mainstream energy source, are successfully isolated in their own sphere. Almost like an isolated cancer to be eradicated by clean energy supply chemotherapy with the intent of the ISCOT to systematically displace fossil fuels energy component as soon and as aggressively as possible 
for the sake of our biosphere's survival. Please note that fossil minerals, fossil minerals are the same thing but simply not intended to burn, have extraordinary beneficial potential as complex carbon-based products to be used in many environmental and industrial applications, especially when clean, independent baseload energy becomes truly abundant and without cost for being a proto-commodity. Just as an example of the potential to use proto-commodity energy to refine fossil minerals will allow an extreme reduction of carbon emissions and control of its usual polluting effects. Reward. The effort. Because the ISCOT is proposed to be isolated from the rest of the economy and energy is considered to be a proto-commodity, the reward of the ISCOT is humanity's progress itself and the people taking part in the success of the ISCOT must receive the independently agreed reward, an equitable claim on wealth in the real economy based on the overall success as defined above. From a monetary perspective, it might be feasible to have the IESCOT contributors' monetary reward be in the form of the creation of new fiat money or cryptocurrency or any sovereign trusted new money. Because of the intrinsic benefit of the IESCOT's energy supply to the economy, this kind of reward will not contribute to inflation. This does not imply that this idea will solve inflation. It simply proposes that it has the potential to be inflation neutral. Bad fiscal decisions will remain the prerogative of any nation or group. Let the minds and hands compete for success. The IE Escot does not exclude internal forms of competitive exploration for better methods of supply within the single objectives agreed parameters for the community of trust. It is envisaged that the IE Escot will operate more like a purely scientific peer review community of specialists searching and executing this single imperative. The first effect of this idea to consider is resistance and rejection by some or even most of society at large. Something you might be screaming in your mind at this very moment. If you manage to consider my rethink of progress up till this point, however, I truly hope that I might be winning you over to the idea. But to this very probable reality, of partial or complete rejection of this idea, it seems as if the only answer coming from my understanding of human nature in this regard is that this kind of idea only gets accepted under extreme duress and real existential fear of destruction. To be certain, it is very probable that it was the same conditions of duress and existential fear during and after the two world wars of the 20th century and more recently the worldwide pandemic that led to the creation of this idea's classmates in the United Nations, universal human rights and our monetary system. Today we know what an existential threat looks like. In the aftermath of the most recent pandemic we have to fundamentally ask what next? Therefore, I will still present my idea to the increasingly hostile, frightened humanity of which I'm just one frail member. When we acknowledge the inexcusable failures of the current global institutions, we are forced to find a way to reform them. Reforming valued institutions is the way our civilization has been succeeding for millennia. We don't just simply destroy institutions especially today when nuclear weapons are a reality. My sincere hope is that we do something like what this idea proposes, hopefully before another apocalypse and not when we must deal with a post-apocalyptic aftermath. The first sign of a proto-positive effect might be that the IES cot might start to be phased in as part of the fear experienced by nation states, regions or civilizational trust communities. However, the network efficiency of this kind of community of trust will only become truly independent and successful when the IES COT 
manages to deliver in a measured way, detached from all human fears and power relations, and become isolated from destructive attacks as a result of a universal commitment to its independence and isolation. With an increasingly more successful IES cot, supplying ever-increasing amounts of energy, the current enterprises and economies that are plagued by inefficient, scarce, intermittent or fossil fuel-based energy supply can actively start to direct their efforts towards the real human and environmental issues other than energy supply that need to be addressed, irrespective of the ideological methods to be used. Since energy costs are a major obstacle to new enterprises, this method of energy supply will unlock vast economic opportunities, driving exponential job growth in nearly any community through reliable and abundant energy. These efforts include, first of all, the realization of good living for all, according to their own definition of good living, then also enable large-scale initiatives, currently in the human imagination, to solve the real challenges we experience. Challenges of which hope for the future and redemption from past and future environmental and other errors seem to be the most important for today's communities. Reduction of man-made greenhouse gas emissions or space exploration or full-scale replacement of earthbound resources with space-based resources from our solar system or beyond. All efforts to ensure the dedicated pristine future of our biosphere while we have the good life to enjoy it. Human activity could overcome socially induced energy scarcity and its related hopelessness through an optimizing independent process while maintaining each society's norms and freely evolving human nature. Moral imperatives that lead to the reduction of the evil, bad impact of human activities can be achieved without reducing human aspirations and hopefulness for a better future. Possibly, cleaning up and protecting nature can become the most valued commodities and services we desperately need. For instance, the successful reduction of unchecked pollution that might currently not be economically feasible within many of our critical industries. Life will go on as normal, even more so. Because only the vested interests in global energy supply will be disconnected from all other interests. The effect will be that all other interests associated with any potential use of energy will remain in the sphere of day-to-day -day human activities of wealth, creation, trust or disputes, allowing for all the messy opportunities for advancements according to human reality with or without utopian ideologies, economies can execute any economic or moral imperative without the fear or fixation on energy scarcity when the success of the IS cot becomes apparent. Legacy energy interests can become the artificial sun. It is up to them. The opportunity will be created to bring unsustainable legacy energy activities, as can be seen in the entire fossil fuel industry into the influence sphere of the IES COT. Current energy enterprises might potentially be the IES COT's major and most committed enablers, regardless of their current fossil fuel commitments and scale of operations. This allows legacy energy interests to be absorbed into a new accountable sphere, regardless of success or failure. The idea remains viable, regardless of fossil fuel investments as long as it is based on conscious decision-making and freeing resources from unsustainable energy claims. Human conflict will still happen because of clashes of interests other than energy supply and might allow for much more dynamic moral interactions and collective learning, both good and bad, as experienced from any individual, community or group's point of view. As an example, there might be conflict based on the perceived misuse of the energy supplied by the ESCOT. This conflict then needs to be sorted out between individuals and communities and not by the ESCOT, who needs to stand apart from what energy is being used for. 
From my understanding of history, these types of conflicts are usually channeled towards extreme progress in technology, culture, aesthetics, and most of the highest human aspirations. The idea will still have mostly non-utopian effects because our actual human nature will still happen in the normal, deliberately conscious, cooperative, unpredictable, anarchic, realistic, evil, but ultimately life-sustaining and loving way it has always happened because the energy supply will simply be put back in the same sphere of abundance and the fungible form humanity has experienced when the energy from the sun was the only large-scale energy source. Nature's own energy systems like solar, wind and gravitational energy effects can and in my mind should be dedicated to nature's own purposes within all natural habitats not for human consumption. I will always strongly believe that human aspirations should not be energized by stealing from nature through solar, wind, or even hydro energy. In as far as humans freely choose to only aspire to live in perfect balance with nature, which I am skeptical about regardless of my own romantic view of humanity and nature, the better approach still seems to be to allow human activity to isolate its energy needs from the naturally occurring needs of the biosphere. The biosphere we are responsible for, or at least share with other organisms, we also consider valuable. The implicit objective of this idea is for humanity to supply energy newly created for new human activities. This concludes the rethink of progress and hopefully, now you see what a hybrid non-utopian idea looks like. My sincere hope is that this idea infused you with many ideas of your own.